<laughs> Maybe I don't want to go sit down. Patience is a virtue, did you know that? I got it. <laughs> No. <laughs> good morning. Good morning, brother. It's good to see your smiling faces. And welcome to Sunday School. 295. Thank you very much. In the blue book. You're welcome. Thank you. 295 to begin our Sunday School. 295.
book of Mark. Chapter 1, verse 14. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for a beautiful day that you've given us to enjoy the time of fellowship where we can all come together. We pray that you would bless our time together and help us to learn about you. And uh, pray that you would be glorified in the world. Chapter 1, verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. I'll stop there. Um, in verses 2 and 3, we read about prophecies concerning Jesus in Isaiah and Malachi, about preparing the way for the Lord, making straight paths before him. And we heard John the Baptist witness about him, that the one coming after him would uh, bring about the, the Spirit of God. And now in verse 14, for the first time, you know, we hear Jesus speak, and we hear Jesus' message. And uh, these verses, they tell us some important things. Uh, they tell us, first of all, that the mission of Jesus is a, is a kingdom mission. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a turning point here in verse 14, which says that after John was put in prison, now from the, from the other Gospels, we know that there, this was a long time before this happened. And just, he didn't go to prison right away, you know. Um, after Jesus came on the scene. But, you know, Mark's gospel is a lot shorter, so the stories are more condensed and put up beside each other. But there is some time before, you know, when, when he baptizes Jesus, uh, John isn't immediately arrested. There is um, some time there where John is still baptizing and Jesus at the same time. Remember, um, John's disciples came to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus is baptizing, and he's getting more people than you're getting. And they says, you know, that's the way it should be. You know, he must increase, I must decrease. And so, you know, there was still a time where both of them were, were active here. Um, so, but uh, Mark chooses to kind of pass over some of those stories. But Mark's concern now is with this turning point in Jesus' ministry, and he says, John was put in prison, you know, that he, John the Baptist had done his, his work in that area. And, uh, you know, he, um, remember, he, he, why he's in prison is because he was arrested by Herod. And um, Herod, uh, this Herod is Herod Antipas. He's one of Herod the Great's sons uh, that, uh, you know, tried to kill the babies when Jesus was born. And so this is Herod Antipas, and he's fallen in love with a woman named Herodias. And she was married to his half-brother, and he divorced uh, the woman that he was presently married to, and that caused a lot of problems with uh, his father-in-law, uh, because he was a king and they went to war, and... Uh, but after he, he dumped her and then married Herodias, she also left her husband, Philip, which was Herod's half-brother. And so John the Baptist kind of called them out on this and uh, said that this was a great evil and that they were, what they were doing was uh, against the scriptures. And, uh, you know, they didn't violated what God had said in the scriptures and it was immoral and all those things and um, so needless to say you know this didn't make Herod very happy 
but it especially bothered uh, Herodias. Um, she was after his head for a long time. Herod kept him in prison. He wanted to hear him. He kept him. In, wanted to keep him in prison. He didn't want to kill him actually. Um, but you know the story. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so that's why he he was uh, arrested. But you know his time was over. He had done the things that God had called him to do. He had, he, had, he had come to prepare the way for Jesus. That was his mission. And now Jesus is um, on the scene, as like I said in the other Gospels, he's starting to, the, the, the um, popularity is supposed to, starting to shift to Jesus now, which is the way it should be. Um, and so this is kind of a turning point for Jesus. And um, so he kind of takes center stage now, and, and Jesus, is, he's, it says he begins proclaiming, the time has come. Uh, the time of the fulfillment is here, you know, that, uh, you know, people had gone out into the desert, you know, to see John, to hear John the Baptist. And Jesus' ministry is going to be different. He doesn't just stay at the de desert and people come to Jesus. Jesus travels around and intersects in people's lives, goes where they're at and meets them in their specific uh, homes and places and so there's a lot of people that uh, wouldn't do that kind of thing. You know, there was, there's a lot of people that would never go out to see John the Baptist out in the desert. Um, and there were some that would, but there's a lot of people that wouldn't do that kind of thing. Jesus goes to meet people where they're at, you know. He'll, he'll go to their home, go to their place. Some, some people don't even want to meet Jesus, but he's going to meet them anyway. <laughs> he's going to... He's going to say what he wants to say in your life, and you can either accept it or reject it. But he, you know, his mission is more, you know, going where the people are at. And uh, so, and he doesn't concentrate his mission where you think, like around Jerusalem. Um, it's more in the outskirts, you know, it's more up in Galilee and, and some of these far-reaching areas. And uh, that's where Jesus spends a lot of his time. He does spend some time in Jerusalem, more at the end. And partly it's because of all of the politics down there. And you have all the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and uh, any time that uh, Jesus is down in that area, you know, they're trying to kill him. So that's another reason. But, um, but he is in control of his life. And whenever they try to do that, you know, it's not his time, it says, so he's able to escape and move on. But, but uh, so Jesus' message says he began pro proclaiming the good news of God. <clears throat> now, this is his mission. Now, ultimately, his main mission is going to be the cross. Uh, but until then, for the next three years, this is his mission, to preach the gospel, to preach the good news. Um, jump down to, to uh, verse 38 of chapter 1. It says, Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also, for this is why I have come. So there Jesus states that. You know, this is why I've come. I've come to preach the good news. He was wanting to travel around to these various villages to do that very thing, to to proclaim the good news to herald the message that his father has given him. <clears throat> Verse 39 says, So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So in terms of priorities, you know, Jesus puts the, the preaching, the proclamation as the, the first and, and most important thing that, that he came to do. Now, he will do miracles. Um, and uh, he will show his power through his miracles. Uh, it'll show who he is, you know, that he is God and that you should listen to what he's saying because he, there is power behind his words. And he will do good works, you know. He'll help people. His, a lot of his miracles were just because he, was, he had compassion on people and he wanted to help them in their, in their state that they were in. Um, but uh, but he came to preach the gospel, and so that's what he's doing. 
Um, he, he's preaching what, what God had sent him there to preach. Um, and this is the message that people needed to hear, you know, because the, the miracles, they didn't save anybody. You know, even the ones he rose from the dead, they still died later. And he came back from the dead for a while, but then they eventually died again, right? So the miracles were only temporary fixes to the real problem. The real problem is a problem of our soul, and that's sick and dying is dead. And so Jesus came to fix the souls of man, and that's his main thing. So his preaching, you know, that's his focus because he wants to be able to tell them the good news. So he's preaching these profound words. They're words that are everlasting. The Bible says that the scriptures will never, they will endure forever. They will never, never fail. So Jesus came to, to preach the gospel. That's what he would do for the next three years. And ultimately, like I said, you know, his, his ultimate mission that he came to earth was to lay down his life for us, to take his sins, to take our sins upon him, and then to be resurrected. Um, and that was his main mission, but we have three years before that happens. And so in that time, Jesus is preparing them all for that ultimate, you know, goal. He's preparing their, in the same way that John Baptist was preparing them for Jesus, Jesus is getting their souls ready. He's speaking truth, you know, he's um, speaking a lot of things that people hadn't heard before. You know, the Sermon on the Mount takes things to a whole different level, you know, than what they had heard in the Old Testament. And there was, Jesus' teachings were fresh, they were new. And so people, you know, they're going to be changed by the things that, that Jesus said. And we're still changed by them. If you read through the Sermon on the Mount, um, it's going to, it's going to knock you flat. Uh, I guarantee it, if you're really listening to what it says and changing your life accordingly. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is, is a hard scriptures to to really uh, they're great but they uh they uh they make you take a look uh, a deep look at yourself and that there's some much needed change that needs to happen if i'm gonna be doing what he's saying here you know and so and so um he came he, his message was to preach about the kingdom but uh, verse two says he he preached that the time has come that the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And the phrase, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, uh, it's used 120 times in the Gospels. So this is this is the main emphasis, you know, of, of what Jesus, when he would say things, when he, a lot of his parables, he said, he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And then he would give a parable that, you know, would point you to what the kingdom of God is like. And, uh, but this was one of his main themes that he brought up over and over again. He's always talking about the kingdom of God or the, the kingdom of heaven. And what's interesting is that that phrase doesn't appear anywhere in the Old Testament. So this, again, is something new to the ears of the Jewish people, you know, when they hear this. Um, it's a distinctive term that Jesus um, uses, and he doesn't really explain it either. You know, it's kind of one of those things. Jesus doesn't always clarify what he says. He'll say things, and then you have to figure it out. Even because his parables are like that, of course, you know, they're always kind of a puzzle that you got to figure out. But even in just short little sayings, they're puzzles that you got to figure out too. Like, kingdom of God is at hand. Well, what's that mean? You know, and you can so, and everything he says is, you know, you take a double take and what, what do you mean? You know, and his disciples did that to him all the time because he would say strange things. Yes, Pam. And it's, it's one thing for us to look back on it. Of course, we know what it means. And yeah, we right. We a bunch of dummies, you know. Yeah, right. But from their end, it was, it was a whole different ballgame. Yeah, because he was introducing all of these things to them. So, 
Um, so he introduces this phrase. So what what is what does he mean by that? Uh, because he never defines it. Um, he never says, you know, here's what I mean by that. Now, on one level, the Jewish people had this concept, you know, that, that God was their king. I mean, if you're talking about a kingdom, and we're talking about a king, right? <laughs> so, you know, on one level, the people of God, they knew that God was their, they knew that God was their king. But, um, at the same time, they rejected him as their king. Um, and uh, so... There is actually a story where this is talked about in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 4. It says, So all of the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Uh, but when they said, Give us a king to lead us. This displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to what the people are saying to you. It's not you that they have rejected. But they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day that I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you now. Listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. So in this passage, it identifies, God himself is talking here, and it identifies the fact that he is their king, that he's always been their king. But they haven't respected him as they should a king. They, they haven't ever been obedient subjects, as subjects would do for a king, to follow him. And do what he asks. And so they've never really acknowledged him or seen him in this way as a king. They've always just done whatever they want. They were kind of their own gods and they did whatever they pleased them. They never listened to God. So God says here, you know, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their king. And he says, really, they have from the very beginning. Since I brought them out of Egypt, they've been rejecting me as their king. So God himself see, has always seen himself as king, you know, over his, his people. But they wanted an earthly king, you know, because they wanted to be like the other nations around them. And so, you think an earthly king is going to be more just and do things righteously than God? I don't think so. <laughs> so, their mindset is just backwards, you know. But that's what they, you see, you know, things around you in this world, that's what you know, and that's what you want, you know, but God is offering something much better. He would be a much better king for them, but they don't want him, so they rejected him. So God's always been a king over his people. I, it's just, he, they never treat him like that. But now Jesus has come in the flesh. And he's one of them because he's a human being. He's taken on flesh. And he's their king and he's in their midst. So sometimes they'll say, you know, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Or it's among you. Or it's at hand. Because it's partly just Jesus being there that the kingdom of God is at hand. Because he's there. Right? So that's part of it too. But also, there's another part um, and we studied this a little bit when we were talking in Daniel because remember uh, in, in Daniel chapter 2 you had all of these kingdoms that it showed um, in this uh, statue the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and there were various kingdoms that came and then there was the stone that rolled down the mountain and uh, crushed all of these other kingdoms and we talked about how that is symbolic of the church. What, God, what Jesus came to do to establish here on earth was the kingdom, his church. We are kingdom. We are a kingdom of priests, and he is our king. We are called the children of the king. And uh, so, um, so partly the kingdom of God is a phrase that just, when he was saying that, you know, that he's among them, and he's telling them, I'm your king and I'm in your midst, and the kingdom of God is here. But also, 
that he was establishing uh, a kingdom people. You know, he was planting seeds, and these seeds would grow and they would develop into what is now the church. And remember when he talked to Peter and he said, he talked about building the church, and he said that even the, the gates of hell won't be able to prevail against it. So this is going to be a kingdom that nobody, I mean, people have tried to squash the church over the centuries. They've tried to put it out, but they're never successful because this is God at work, and his church will never die. And there might be times where there's more of a remnant or times where it's explosive, but the church will always exist because it's God's kingdom, and it's always going to be here. Um, so there's that element to it too, and then, but then there's, there's kind of another element that the kingdom of God is, is coming too. Um, because, you know, it's a spiritual kingdom. Remember we talked about that. It's not a literal kingdom that Jesus established in his spiritual kingdom. He's reigning from on his throne. He is the head of the church. That's how he's established, and he's the king, and he's reigning from up there. We are his subjects down here. So that's, you know, that's part of it. And remember when Pilate um, talked to Jesus and about being a king, because they were trying to accuse him of, um, you know, um, what? Being against Rome. Right. Yeah, being and, against Nero. And so he asked him, you know, are you a king? And Jesus said, um, my kingdom is not of this world. So it's a spiritual kingdom, you know, it's, it's not a, a physical kingdom, it's a, it's a spiritual kingdom. But um, the, the people, you know, they were looking for the Messiah. They, they might have not had this terminology in their heads of this kingdom of God thought. But they did have the idea of a Messiah coming who would uh, basically do the job of a king. That they would be free from Rome, the Roman oppression that was on their backs, you know, that this Messiah would come and overthrow that, and they could be a kingdom again, like in the days of Solomon, you know, that this Messiah would reign and he would be greater than Solomon, and uh, the, the Israel would have back, you know, their nation, and they could do the things they wanted to do the way they wanted to do them without Rome breathing down their necks. So that's kind of what they were looking for. Um, um, and so, in a way, they kind of understood that idea, you know, of this kingdom of God that was coming. Um, but they didn't have it right, of course, because, you know, what Jesus came to do as their king was much greater than just getting the Romans off their back. He came to deliver them from sin and from death and from evil uh, and establish an eternal, everlasting kingdom which is so much greater, but their concept was just too tiny, you know, and that's why a lot of them rejected him, because they didn't understand what his mission was all about. And uh, so he, he came in a different way, but we have, we have this, this talk also, you know, of this, this kingdom that is coming, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the kingdom that he established with the church, and with this coming in the flesh, is ultimately going to be realized, you know, when we get to heaven, and when we have the new heavens and the new earth. We will be a kingdom of people, and we will reign, it says God will reign with us forever and ever. He will be our king in that respect. And even when we take the Lord's Supper, you know, one of the, um, in Luke, it says, when Jesus is giving instructions for the Lord's Supper, remember he said, I tell you, I will not drink, uh, again, the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Remember he said that? So he's talking about the ultimate fulfillment of the kingdom of God that's going to be fulfilled. And so when we get to heaven, we are going to partake in the Lord's Supper with Christ. All the believers will be together taking the Lord's Supper. And that will be a neat time. And it also talks about a wedding feast, you know, the wedding feast of the Lamb. There'll be this 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 feast, but part of that will be uh, partaking all together uh, with um, the in the Lord's Supper. But the groom will be with his bride. We are the bride of Christ, and this will be a wedding feast, and it'll be a celebration. 
Um, so there's this this uh, ultimate fulfillment of the kingdom of God. You know, when 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 He comes back again in all of His power and all of His glory. In Mark chapter eight, verse thirty-eight, talks about Jesus coming in His Father's glory with the, the holy angels. In Matthew twenty-four twenty-seven, it says, "For as lightning comes from the east and is visible in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be." In verse 30 says, At that time they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the heavens uh, to another. And at his trial, even remember when um, Caiaphas was interrogating him, and uh, Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And uh, in, Re in Revelation 11, it says, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So the kingdom of God is coming, in which, which we will reign with him forever and ever. We're, we're always going to be the children of the king, and we're going to be his subjects, and he's going to be the king that reigns over us. So this kingdom will last for all of eternity. Um, but like I said, the kingdom of God is in one sense already here because this church has been established. And we are part of that, that kingdom. And it's our job to proclaim the gospel. We are his ambassadors. You know, just as a, an ambassador of, of a king or a kingdom would go and, you know, and bring that message, we are the ambassadors of Christ. And it's our job to spread the gospel just just as jesus is uh beginning to spread that here you know when he's starting his ministry it's our job to carry that on we are ambassadors of the king and we are to go and proclaim this gospel message to proclaim about this kingdom that god wants all people to be a part of and so that's the job that we have now is the church uh, we are supposed to God is working through us to, to grow this church and to make it like, you know, what Daniel was talking about, this big rock that crushes everything else and it just grows and grows and grows. Um, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God once using uh, yeast and a, a, loaf, a lump of dough, remember? And he said how the, the yeast will get in the dough and it'll infect the whole thing. And, um, and a lot of times when he used those analogies, it was a negative thing. Yeast was a negative thing, but this in this instance it was a positive thing. That this yeast would get in the dough and make it grow, and that would be like the kingdom of God, how it spreads. And that's how the kingdom of God is supposed to spread. So we have a job, you know, as ambassadors to to carry out that message and to proclaim the message as Jesus was beginning to do there. But there will be the ultimate fulfillment, of course, because we don't see it's just a spiritual kingdom right now and it's hard for us to sometimes visualize that but one day we will be with our king and we will reign with him as subjects of self anyone have any comments yes jerry you know it's really hard sometimes to um keep focused on this on the spirituality of life because uh mm -hmm. we have uh, other things to do we have to eat Seeing the unseen, which is part of where our faith stems from, is, is having that certainty and believing in things that are unseen. So, well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus who came to proclaim the gospel message that he is our king and, and help us to follow him as subjects of the king, to not reject him as the people of Israel did long ago, but to accept him, acknowledge him, acknowledge him as our king, to follow him, and want to be obedient to his will. So we pray that we can do that, and also just to be the ambassadors that you've called us to be, to continue to spread the message of, of the kingdom and the good news of Christ and what he came to do.
pray as we go into worship time, Lord. Give us hearts that are focused. And uh, may you be glorified in everything we do this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 